Hey everyone, welcome back to the food forest. My goal with this video is create some more plant nerds, some certifiable plant nerds among people who maybe don't understand just how cool plants are. I think my last video on soil science would be a good thing to watch before you watch this one. So if you haven't seen that yet, check it out. That video kind of showed me that maybe there's an appetite out there for more plant science and you guys actually really dig this stuff, pun intended. <laughs> Humans really think that we're the super smart creature who's got it all figured out. But plants really are the chemists of the world. I don't think human progress will ever touch what plants are doing in the world of chemistry. Stick around guys. Growing up, one of the things I was really interested in is space. Space is really one of those things that I just absolutely love. Humans are really these uh, explorers by nature. I think one of the reasons I really fell in love with plants is that there's so much unknown going on under the soil, under the feet on our own planet. There's really kind of three massively unexplored frontiers, and that's space, our oceans and the soil. We know almost nothing about them. And the more that we learn about them, the more that we understand that we have so much more to learn about them. Now, the reason I'm talking about space is that one of the things that I've always found fascinating is the search for extraterrestrial life. And I love the question of, would we even recognize life if we found it? And for example, on Earth, every single life form is made with a backbone of carbon. Carbon is the building blocks of all life on Earth. If you look on the periodic table where carbon is, silicon is actually right below it. And a lot of scientists postulate that there's a high likelihood that on other planets, there could be intelligent life that's actually made with a backbone of silicon. Now imagine such a world, maybe a cave-like planet with all these rocks and minerals, you know, jutting up out of the surface. And this is the environment that another life form ended up evolving in over billions and billions of years. These organisms would maybe have very, very long lifespans and the ways that they communicate with each other might be completely foreign to us. We think that we can communicate to other life forms through math, but what if other life forms communicated in completely unrecognizable ways. And we may not even be able to recognize intelligence if we were staring it in the face. Plants don't communicate using sound. They don't communicate using language. They don't communicate even by moving. They communicate largely through chemistry. And we're only starting now to figure out and understand how complicated the ways that plants communicate back and forth to each other actually is. The discovery of the fungal mycelial network was kind of groundbreaking and revolutionary in this sense because experiments were shown that plants actually communicate to each other over long distances using a symbiotic relationship with a mycorrhizal that is a root connecting fungus. Now there were experiments done using this network where they would take two pepper plants and they would have them in pots separated by a fairly small distance and they would introduce a pest to one of the pepper plants. That pest would consume some of the pepper plants and go to the next pepper plant and it would consume it as well. Then they took the same two plants and instead of putting them in pots separated by pots, they put them in the soil and they let the fungal mycelial network grow. And now what they found was fascinating. When a pest landed on one pepper plant, that pepper plant sent information to the other pepper plant, notifying it that it was being attacked by a pest. And that other pepper plant released phytochemicals into the air, which then attracted a predator of that pest. So plants were actually communicating to each other through the fungal mycelial network and telling other plants, hey, I'm under attack, 
to attract predators of that pest and maybe save them. Plants aren't mobile. Think about humans. If we have some kind of predator chasing us, or if there's an environment that we don't want to exist in, such as a fire immediately around us, if we can get out of the way, if a predator's coming, we can just simply run. Plants can't. When a tree grows, it's there for the rest of its life. It might be there for hundreds and hundreds of years. So how does an organism that can't escape danger end up surviving and passing on its genetics billions of years later? The answer is basically through chemistry. Now humans have been trying to understand plants for a very long time. As an example, the USDA has a list of about 44 nutrients that it believes plants uses, 17 of which are considered essential. And these are things that go into the food that we eat and as well into the leaves of the actual plant. And if you watched my video on soil microbiology, specifically the section on chelation, chelation is the way that plants acquire these nutrients and then bind them to amino acids. Really, it's the soil microbiology, specifically the larger protozoa and nematodes that will bind in their digestive systems, calcium, for example, to an amino acid, and in this way, now it becomes bioavailable to the plants. We've only kind of discovered this, you know, roughly in the last hundred years. Plants have been around for a very long time, and humans have been trying to understand them for a very long time. And we're only figuring this level of thing out now, that plants can't just take calcium. We can't just put calcium on the ground and it'll end up in the plants we actually need a conversion mechanism to make it bioavailable to the plants. And it's the soil microbiology that does that. Let's take a step back and understand what's actually happening here. We have an immobile organism that understands that there are other mobile organisms around them. And plants put out plant root exudates, which are like sugary cakes. They put that out through the roots in order to entice the mobile organisms to bring them all the things that they need in towards themselves. So a lot of people will say that there's no inherent intelligence in plants. And I completely agree with that. But I want to frame that in that there's no inherent intelligence to plants that we understand as humans because their intelligence is different than ours and it's so different than ours that we can't even understand it there's a certain subcategory of botany that's going on right now where scientists are trying to learn exactly how these 44 nutrients that a plant needs actually turns into compounds so there's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sodium, iodine, iron, manganese. There's so many different atoms that plants need. But now we know that they don't just need that actual atom. It's not like they just take a calcium atom. They have to bind it to a phenol group inside an amino acid. So now we're introducing another level of complexity because this calcium might not just be alone. It might be bound to other atoms and elements as well. And the amino acid could be very different. So the research that's going on is trying to understand not just the elements that the plants need, but the compounds that plants use in their bodies and what they're actually doing. And the goal is that maybe if we understand this stuff, then we can understand how to use it for human uh, benefit. So just as an example, a plant can't get out of the sun. It has no way to move itself into shade. So plants release compounds that they excrete through their leaves that acts as a natural sunscreen and UV repellent. And this prevents damage to the leaves. This is all done through super complicated biochemistry that I don't even understand. And I will probably never understand even if I read it a million times. But the smartest people on the planet who are devoting careers into this field are only starting to barely understand just some of these little minute details 
that plants actually communicate with each other or use compounds to boost their defenses in certain areas in response to stimuli because they can't get out of the way of that stimulus. Now in my video on soil microbiology, one of the things I talked about was those plant root exudates, how plants attract various organisms to them. And as we learned about how these plant root exudates work, we started discovering that there's more and more of them than we thought. What originally we thought was a plant root exudate where they're pumping carbohydrates and sugars into the soil, we now understand that there's actually hundreds of millions of different plant root exudates that the plant will actually exude into the soil. And they do this because they want to attract very specific soil microbiology to address the very specific needs that the plant has at the time. If there's a deficiency in sodium around the plant, then they start exuding a specific exudate to attract a microorganism that bioaccumulates sodium, for example. So it's in this way that plants have this incredible intelligence where they can't move, but they can leverage chemistry in order to attract the things that can move. And they can leverage chemistry in order to interact with the other kingdoms, such as my mycelial networks, to communicate to plants that are far away from them, even upwards of kilometers away. And the fact that we can't understand half of this stuff, and we may never understand half of this stuff, really goes to show you one thing, that we should be very, very careful when we take a human action into a living organic system like this that has evolved for billions of years with tons of symbiotic relationships between all the little microorganisms, and we start taking human action to really, you know, feed the plants. You know, so we say we have to fertilize our plants, so we're gonna just put these 44 essential nutrients into the ground, and that's good. This analogy will be how humans look at plants, and the comparison will be how some kind of silica-based space life form would look at humans and try to understand us when we're such drastically different organisms. So these aliens come down and look at us and they can start to understand our writing. Now after studying us for 10 years they can make out say 9 out of 26 of the letters of the English alphabet. This is kind of like humans understanding you know NPK for plants. Now their understanding of human civilization is very crude at best but given another hundred years they figured out all the letters of the alphabet. And they've also even figured out that we combine them in ways where we take this letter and that letter and this letter and we put them together and we make these things called words. So now more time passes by and these aliens have actually figured out that we actually communicate back and forth to each other using these visual symbols. And they've now even discovered a few thousand of the words that we use. And they don't know what they are, they don't know what they mean, but they do know that in this specific combination of that letter, this letter, and that letter, that that makes some kind of word that we then use somehow. Now they may only understand 1200 words, but they have a pretty good idea, or at least they think they do, of what human language and communication is. Now there are 171,000 different words in the English language. That's just words. But we then take those words and we combine them and put them into sentences. And through the various combination of words, we create language. Through this language, we communicate emotion. We communicate information. We can actually pass information on from generation to generation using our language. Now, one combination of these letters could teach somebody how to bake an apple pie. Another combination of these letters could write a poem that makes somebody cry. Another combination of different kind of symbols can describe how to play a piece of music. And another combination could teach math or be the schematics of how to build and design a space station.
Humans like to think that we're the most intelligent species on the planet, and it could just be that we're the most intelligent species as far as we define intelligence. And there are other organisms on this planet that are equally as intelligent, but just in completely unrecognizable ways. Plants, through their extremely advanced chemistry, are exuding some level of intelligence in the way that they react. Even if it's just automatic and it's just input stimulus, the way that they can then produce a specific compound to then fight what they need to fight or communicate to each other is absolutely fascinating. And that is why I have become a certifiable plant nerd. Thank you.